Good morning. I don't know whether, can you hear me? Yeah, I guess so. I can hear myself, yeah. There's a few people just uh, coming in. Uh, I want to thank all of you who are here in the house of God as we come to worship together and to praise together, especially sing and listen to God's word. This is a time of worship for us, and as we come as friends and family, we've been coming here for a long time, some of us almost a lifetime, but it is a wonderful testament that each one of your presence encourages one another. When we miss our friends not here, when we miss those whom we have uh, held, hold in high esteem and not here for whatever reason, uh, it kind of brings our heart down a little bit. But I think we are here to support one another and to enjoy each other's company and to also say how much we appreciate each one of you uh, who are here in the house of God to worship together. I see there is a little uh, time differential between the clock in front of me and my clock, so I got two extra minutes. So if, so if I go longer in the message, you know, those two extra minutes are mine. I want to welcome all of you and welcome those who are joining us for the Facebook Live. We want to thank you for joining us. Be with us for the next hour and sing with us and study, read with us and listen to the music and especially come into the God's presence with your entire family. Go and invite others to come and this is a wonderful time to be together. Uh, this is the Lord's day for he has made us glad and we are in his presence. And this morning we are grateful to Dean and Laura, who's going to be leading in worship. But Dean, you please come. Good morning. I'd like to add my welcome to that of Pastor Sundar, to those of you in the sanctuary and everybody watching live on Facebook and those who will be watching the recordings later in the week. Uh, the lovely flowers on the altar this morning were arranged by Kate Henson. We have a number of openings on the flower chart, so if you would like to sign up, there are a lot of opportunities. You can sign up in, on the table in the entryway or call the church office and Gail will get you signed up. A few announcements this morning. Don Haynes will be singing the offertory. Those of you in the sanctuary don't have that in your bulletins. Um, Amber asked me to note that youth group had some special requests for their love kit collection. That will be uh, collected until February 20th. And the shelter has specifically requested the following items. Hand warmers, socks, lotions, washcloths, body wash, hats and gloves, and thermal underwear. And all of those would need to be new but there is a very, very large need for those items. So if you can contribute to that, that would be really great. Thank you. Um, there's an ushers meeting after church, so see Patty and she'll figure out where that's going to take place. And when we begin our service very shortly, the choir will sing number 2272 once through as the introit, and then all of us in the congregation will join uh, second time through. So that's number 2272. And we'll now begin our worship service with the choral introit.
please join me in the call to worship printed in your bulletin. God built the heavens, the earth, and everything in them. God calls us to build our lives. God calls us to build our faith. God calls us to build our community. God calls us to build history by fulfilling the promises of Scripture. Now, please stay standing for the opening hymn, number 662, Stand Up and Bless the Lord. Please stay standing for our opening prayer. Holy One, we thank you for the gift of the scriptures, for its psalms, poems, stories, histories, teachings, and prophecies. May the Holy Spirit who called out those ancient writings continue to call us today, that our lives may reflect the first sermon of Jesus, our crucified and risen Christ, who brings good news to the poor and lets the oppressed go free. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
thank you so much, choir, for that beautiful anthem. We're not having our um, young disciples time. We got a little mixed up on the schedule. That should be next week. So we'll move now into the time of reading of the scripture. And our scripture for this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. And I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue, as he normally did, and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll gave it back to the synagogue assistant, and sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him. He began to explain to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled, just as you heard it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Our second hymn this morning is number 578, God of Love and God of Power. Please stand if you are able. Thank you. Please be seated. Good morning, and how are you doing? <laughs> doing well? So I have a little quiz since I have like those two extra minutes. I, so thought of asking you, the verse three of the first hymn, we sang, stand up and bless the Lord. I'm going to read that to you once, the verse three. Oh, for the living flame from this his own altar brought, to which our lips, our minds inspired, and wing to heavens our thought. Can you recall what scripture it is taken from? Psalm 
Close, it's in the Old Testament. It was Isaiah. Young Isaiah was in the temple. Temple is a wonderful way. This is our temple. This is our sanctuary. A wonderful way of God encountering people. We encountering God. And Isaiah saw this, the most high and the holy of holies. And uh, when God asked him a question, so who will go for me? There is so much to be done, Isaiah, a young man. Who will go for me? And he blurted out, I will, kind of. You know, sometimes when you're in the pre presence of God, we say things we actually don't know where it came from. He said, oh, okay, I'll do this, Lord. But I said, why did I say that? And then God takes the coal from, here's his vision. God takes the coal from the Holy of Holies and touches his lips. It's very symbolic that God has anointed him, touched his lips so that he can say the, speak the words of God. And his words are still alive today. And this today, the scripture was read by Jean this morning to us. So this is a place where God touches our lips. God touches our hearts. God touches our lives to move us forward. This is a place where we all encounter God in one way or the other. Not all of us encounter him the same way. But God is always there for us. And we encounter God, we can never go back the same as we walked in. There is not a single case in the entire the book of the Bible where individuals have come before God and said, eh, I'm going to go back and do the same thing. They've all been transformed. It's wonderful to know that part of it. The world is abuzz these days about values. We have been struggling with the values from the beginning. We promote our values, we debate our values, we vote our values, fight over our values, then teach our values, and hopefully live our values as well. Values are the personal qualities that sustain us in the big picture of life. Values are a set of guiding principles that help us make decisions. Values are beliefs and attitudes about what is good and right and desirable and worthwhile. But on the contrary, People with fuzzy values live fuzzy lives. So this morning, I invite you to use these few minutes to examine your values. I want you to lift the floorboards of your convictions and examine them in the presence of Jesus. We all have a set of values we follow. We also have a set of values we pass it on to our children and to our friends and, you know, how we... So today I want you to lift those floorboards of your convictions, where you walk on those values, where you stand firm on those values, and examine them in the presence of Jesus. Always, always examine them in the presence of the Scripture, in the presence of Jesus. So I want you to question those values, discuss those values, ponder and pray and pursue a life that is pleasing to God. I urge you to use the tools of our scripture that is made available to all of us. Scriptures are wonderful tools for us to know who God is and to understand God's purpose for our lives. Not to be indoctrinated, but to be invigorated. You can easily memorize and get indoctrinated, but never invigorated. Read the scriptures so that your hearts and your lives will be invigorated through it. So how do we develop our values? We develop them by ch from our childhood. Proverbs 22, 3 says, start up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not turn from it. It's a guarantee from God's word saying that no matter what is happening in their lives, if you start them right in the word, they will return to it. What children learn in their first six years of life will be the way they live for most of their lives. It's like putting a, you know, it's putting like a thing which where they can stand on it. In Nashville and NFL sports world, people are outraged 
we were watching yesterday Titans uh, game against the Bengals. This was two years ago. Titans football player Adam Pacman Jones was known for his skills in the field. He has this little incident when he was in a bar called Clutch, OTR, in Cincinnati, Ohio on February 15, 2021. Something happened to him. Whatever that happened, sent him over the edge of tolerance, leaving three people injured. He was convicted for assault in bar fight. All the money, all the fame, and all the football stardom did not endow him a moral compass. It only exposed what, it al what is already there, or in this case, not there. Pac-Man Jones was recently sentenced to spend time in, in jail. People live with what they learn. I kind of wondered, had you and I have grown up in the streets of Atlanta, during gangs and without a family to guide, and I wonder what would have happened to us. What would have happened to me? And I grew up in a city of five million people. If I didn't have that strong compass, watching my parents and my older brothers and sisters, my church, putting the stamp on me, what Pacman needs is not condemnation. I'm not here to condemn him, but conversion. What he needs is the Lord God Almighty to knock him off his high horse of narcissism and some good Christian friends to teach him the ways of Jesus. You know, if you don't think God makes a difference in a person's life, just compare Pac-Man Jones with Vince Young, another NFL player. Surely, Pacman Jones is a child of God who needs a broken and a contrite heart. We all have, we are all children of God, but our hearts need to be broken at times. Our hearts need to come humbling ourselves. No matter wealth and fame and all those things will guide us. We should all be praying for that to happen in his life and in the people whom we see. We develop our values from our culture, whether or not it is clear to us or not, we, what we hear, what we watch, what we do, what we believe, determine who we are. Let's not be fooled what music and television and internet and advertising, even politics, have an effect on us. Celebrities can't take the place of parents and spiritual mentors in giving children the values. We can easily be tempted to put our children before a computer or a TV or, or some kind of entertainment so that they can raise the children so we can have some free time. Beliefs and habits needed for a meaningful life. There is much emphasis today on reality television. Let me ask you, are reality shows a reality? Do companies really do business like The Apprentice? Do hospital emergency rooms operate like Grey's Anatomy? Does desperate housewife really reflect suburban values? Humorous Ben Stein, who wrote for years about the rich and the famous, concluded that the rich and the famous are not so terribly important. So in his last column, he said this, a person who makes a huge wage for memorizing lines and reciting them in front of a camera is no longer my idea of a shining star. The real stars are parents who take time for their children. The real stars are men and women who give their lives for their country. The real stars are the simple people who care about others. Those are the real stars. We develop our values from religion. We encase our biblical Christian faith. Certainly, people of faith have a role in shaping the values for the individual and the society in which we live. As the great preacher of the 1940s, Harry Emerson Fosdick says in his hymn, save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Someone asked St. Augustine in the fourth century if the world was in moral decline. Fourth century. He was more closer to Jesus than we are ever. Fourth century, he was asked, 
St. Augustine had not a lived a very exemplary life if you read his life. He had a lot of issues. St. Augustine responded this way. It all depends upon the church. It all depends on the church. Fourth century to 21st century. Are we in a moral decline? It all depends on the church. An incredible good person. Lights on a hill. People of faith do season the society and shine rays of hope to the least and the lost. What Boy Scout has not benefited from keeping himself physically fit, mentally awake, and morally strong? But Christians have not always done an excellent job of representing Christ. Too often we have remade our Lord into our own image. We use the name of the Prince of Peace to justify our wars. We steal away behind some proof text of the Bible to justify our prejudice towards others. Proof testing is something that you pick one verse out of the entire scripture to prove your point and ostracize a whole group of people, entire nations of people. It's a very powerful tool for those who use the scripture in that way. Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us the real trouble is that the pure word of Jesus had been overlaid with so many human rules and regulations that it has become extremely difficult to make a genuine decision for Christ. So what are the kingdom values of Jesus? The values of Jesus are good news of great joy. Even the angels, when he was born in Bethlehem, said, good news of great joy is announced to you. So as early fall, probably September-ish, Jesus is fresh out of the wilderness where he has spent 40 days wrestling with the devil. There he clarifies his mission, establishes his purpose, finds the comfort of angels. After an exhausting self-examination and personal struggle, Jesus returns to Nazareth. Sometimes you just want to go home. Get some of your mother's good cooking or your daddy's shy advice. Jesus returned to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. So on the Sabbath day, he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. The lectionary reading of that day was from Isaiah 61, chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. This is what it had to say. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Then Jesus concludes by saying, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It's the drop the mic situation there. The hometown folk were pleased and proud that his hometown boy has come and he's going to do wonderful things. Maybe never forget the gospel is always good news. I don't know about you, but I've heard too many sermons about gloom, despair, and damnation for me. The gospel is not bad news. The gospel is good news. It says in this book, there's life for a look. Jesus can make a difference, make us new. Sermons need to lift us up, not beat us up. Elevate us, not depress us. Enlarge us, not belittle us. Empower us, not defeat us. The values of Jesus bring liberty and release for all. He has sent me to proclaim freedom. That's what Jesus said. For prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind both physical and spiritual, to release the oppressed. As we look around, see, release the oppressed. Our world is being oppressed in so many ways. In so many ways. And we get tempted, you know, when we look at oppression, we say, oh, look at China, look at North Korea, look at Russia. But I think we need to look at very close to our own hearts and our own communities and own cities. Do we have people who are being oppressed in this greatest nation of ours? I don't cry very often in movies, but I found myself in tears when 
a movie which I was watching on the TV. It's an amazing grace, it's called. It's the moving story of William Wilberforce and his lifelong struggle against slavery in the Parliament of England. The young man of unusual ability and noteworthy power relentlessly appealed to the consciences of sophisticated people to stop what no normal person could stand to embrace. He gave his life trying to set people free. What the movie does not include is the fact that the slavery was finally fully outlawed in England on July 26, 1833. Three days later, William Wilberforce died July 29, 1833. Lest we think slavery to be a problem of the past, my friends, there are 18 to 20,000 people trafficked in the United States each year for forced labor and prostitution. There are 27 million enslaved people worldwide. 80% of them are women. Over 21 million people. And over half of them are children under 18. Do they, do they need to be restored? Do they need to be set free? It all depends on the church. Those who have gone before us said, a subplot to that movie is that life of John Newton, the preacher behind Wilberforce, a slave trader himself. Newton says he lives out the latter years of his life with the ghost of 20,000 slaves haunting him in the night. But as he proclaims in the movie, I'm a great sinner, but I found a great savior. And I don't think I'll ever sing about the amazing grace that saved a wretch like me the same again. Jesus can do that for you and for me. The values of Jesus proclaim the year of God's favor for all. This kind of talk got Jesus kicked out of town. But let us not be too quick to judge. These Nazarenes like the idea of Jubilee. Who wouldn't be in favor of a little heaven on earth that grants forgiveness of debts, return of the land to original owners? The year of the Jubilee was the sweet dream of all God's children in Israel. They hoped Jesus would make it happen, so their hope rise with his hometown boy. And Jesus leads no revolution against Rome. Jesus fits no image of their expected Messiah. Jesus is not elected the chief rabbi of Galilee. And worst of all, he tells the home folks that the Jubilee will be for widows and foreigners and lepers, as well as for you and me. Talk like that will get you in big trouble. You'll be labeled as a socialist or even get killed. It was, I think, 1967, around about 67, 70 in the year. I remember Indira Gandhi was, became the prime minister second time. And she and the parliament enacted a law returning all the lands which were confiscated, taken as a collateral for a meager loan of 100 rupees, maybe less than $2, for a farmer who was in difficulty to feed his family. The interest was so compounded to the extent thousands and thousands of percents that the land never became theirs nor their children's. In fact, they had to pay off their debt. They and their consecutive generations paid off their debts by working the land, producing the crops, and giving the crops to their owners, which never was theirs anyway. It was happening in my lifestyle. In my time together, in my living in there. There was such an uproar in the country, such an uproar. How dare she give the, our land away to those wretched people? Talk like that will get you in big trouble. So our story ends with Jesus between a mob and an angry people. If you read the end of the story, Jesus was practically dragged, a mob of angry people, 
I mean, the precipice of a huge cliff that raised the trauma all over us. So I suppose I need to warn you this morning, be careful. If you fully embrace the values of Jesus, you could wind up there too. Between an angry mob and a precipice of a dangerous cliff. So I ask you, would you like to lift the boards of your convictions and examine them in the presence of Jesus? As I have been doing since my high school, when I first encountered Jesus. My friends, it is never too late for any one of us to ask the question and discuss and ponder and pray and pursue a life that is pleasing more to Christ, to pleasing God. Prophets and priests and apostles leave us a trail for all of us to walk in this dangerous world so that you and I didn't lose our way, don't lose our way in this world. Nor do we have to live in fear and compromise. Jesus said, what shall it profit a person to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Those are the values of Jesus. The challenge I put before you and as I put before myself as I was reading the scripture and doing this and as I look back and there's always that challenge to re-examine my values constantly again and again and fall on my knees to ask forgiveness from God. How far I fall short of the glory of God. How far I fall short of God's expectations. My values are so different at times, so self-centered and so me and mine only, rather than Jesus himself. So I want to send you this promise that you serve a risen Christ. You are the apple of his eye. God is not angry with us. God loves us tremendously with unconditional love. God loves you. But at the, ex at the same time, God expects us to re-examine our values and reaffirm our faith in him and, and follow him wherever he leads us. Because it all depends on the church. It all depends on you. You are the church. We are the church. We sing that song all the time. It all depends on us. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, help us, O oh Lord, that these are difficult days, but you call us to do difficult tasks because you are our God, a God who will empower us, energize us, invigorate us, and send us from this wonderful sanctuary into a world of full of chaos, full of needs and full of sadness and hopelessness so that we can go and bring hope and peace and joy and restore people to you in the way you want us to be. Prepare our hearts, O oh Lord, as we come and worship you and go from here as people who have met you. In Jesus' name I pray. Let us continue our worship as we bring our tithes and our offerings. I'd like to, um, as I picked the song this morning, um, the Lord really impressed upon my heart that, you know, we're all living through an age that I thought we never would, but we are. And with the pandemic and all the fears of worrying about, well, you've done everything you can, but you can still go ahead and get it. And it's just been a real, somewhat of a nightmare just to know that, you know, we have to depend on Jesus and lay everything into his hands. And the song that really impressed upon my heart, even though it's a little bit more of a Christmas theme, but just to know that all is well.
And just remember that no matter what happens, the anxieties that we have, that truly all is well in him. and join me in the prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Holy word, holy breath, holy breath of all, with gratitude for making us one body, we share our gifts with one another and with the world. We pray through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We come now to our time of sharing of joys and concerns, and we do have a really nice joy to report today. Uh, Joseph's House is very grateful to our church for the faithful support of their daily lunch programs, which we take care of once a week. 
Thank you to the caring ministries and the families that have been providing these weekly meals. Um, it's a really great service, and, and I'm very glad to know that we're participating in it. And we also heard about a birthday this week. Cassandra Grand's birthday is the 24th, so happy birthday to Cassandra. And as always, we have many, many concerns. Um, from our 8.30 service this morning, uh, we pray for baby Kamari. And from Facebook this morning, um, John Moore is requesting prayers for Sherry St. Louis's niece, whose mother died. And we pray for Russ Van Buren and the family of Ron Young upon his recent death. Ron is uh, Ed Young's brother. We pray for Roland Ferris, David Haas' father-in-law. For the D'Ambrosi family, for Linda and her family, for Deb Samuel, for Paula Deming, for the Haas family, for Jane Schweikert, for Leonard Ditton, Holly Aiken's dad. We pray for Matthew Eckert, for the Reverend Sandy Damhoff, U Albany minister, for Judy and Ed Fountain. We pray for Riley Noon, Samuel Steinbuck, Marie Simmons, for Rebecca Sanderson's best friend's mother and family, for Nellie Smith, for Amanda, niece of Tracy and Don Haynes, for Kara Sattler, Gail Bradley, Thomas Barnes, Crystal Burns. We pray for Lauren Moulton, Jerry and Shirley Dunn, Sandy Comrie, Betty Lennon, Catherine Nardacci, Kenneth Jackson, Randy Veely. We pray for Karen, for Gwen Smith, for Sherry St. Louis, John Moore, Fred Van Ornum, Judy Davis, Sandy Cummings, Louise Well. We pray for Stephen Burnett, Eric Subic, David Smith and his daughter Sally, Paul Smith, Claudia Emmerich, Richard Smith. And we pray for the residents of Riverside, Rosewood, Eddie Heritage House, Van Rensselaer Manor, Peregrine Assisted Living, Collar City Nursing and Rehabilitation, and Hawthorne Ridge. We pray for all of these people and those we hold in our hearts as we sing together our call to prayer. Ushers in your presence, O oh Lord. We come before you in all humility, in adoration and praise. We worship you and praise you and honor you. Who are we to even come? In your closest company, the angels and archangels. Yet you call us to come and sing along with them and bring our praises. You chose us long before the foundations of the earth were laid. You created all humanity in your own image. You put your spirit into us and your wisdom in us. We pray that may we continue to walk in that wisdom with grace. Help us, O oh Lord, to be Christ-like in all that we say and do. This morning, we humble ourselves before you. We ask you to bless our nation. We ask you to bless our president and the vice president and all those who are in authority. We have blessings be upon them. Keep them safe and healthy. We pray for peace in the border here, Crimea, and in Russia and other places. 
we ask for your blessings upon the leaders and the people who are in discussions to bring peace in this world. We pray for our men and women in uniform who have given so much all these years. We pray that you would give them your grace, give them a sense of peace that passes all understanding so they may be with the families and raise their families and enjoy their families, not always be in constant alert. Our gracious and loving God, we pray that you bring peace upon this earth through your son, Jesus Christ. Empower us to be those who go out to make friends with others. We pray for those who need daily sustenance. We pray for the children who need to be rescued from harm. We pray for those who need shelter this cold weather. We pray for those who need jobs and people who need you near in their hearts. Almighty and ever-living God, we pray for all the people whose names were spoken here. We pray that you would touch and heal them and strengthen them, give them your grace, help them to know that you love them unconditionally. May they experience your love in a very special and intimate way today. We pray for all the nations where there is so little. We pray for Tonga and other places who are suffering from floods and earthquakes and so many different ways. We ask your blessings upon them. Help us to be those who lend a helping hand. We thank you for the people who work hard to provide breakfast in our own neighborhoods, we ask your blessings upon them as well. We here we are, O oh Lord, we ready to leave from this holy sanctuary. You have met us, and we have met you. We pray that you would send us forth with the joy that only which comes from you. Send us forth with the assurance that only you can give us. Send us forth with the peace that passes all understanding even as we leave from this place. We offer all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. As we forgive those who trespass against us, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is 57, O Tohara Thousand Tongues to Sing. We will sing stanzas one through five.
please join me in the benediction, which is a unison prayer. It's printed in the bulletin. Let's pray together. As we go from this place on this day holy to God, we rejoice in the strength of God. We fix our eyes on the grace of Christ and we drink deeply of the Spirit who makes us one. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.